Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Lansing Regional and Chamber of Commerce Business Education Series. We're excited to connect with you this morning to talk about fundraising trends for 2021. It's the first day of April. It's snowing out. I guess there's a little snow. Opening day, and it's also Rebecca Behar Cook's birthday. So we're super excited uh, to be able to celebrate her birthday on this Zoom call or a Zoom webinar. Um, but just before we get going here, and I'm going to introduce uh, Eric's and then our speaker, Rebecca, and we'll get going, but just some housekeeping. I know we're all professionals at, at this, but uh, just a reminder, this is a webinar format. Everybody that's entering the room, uh, you'll be placed on mute. Um, if you have questions uh, throughout the program, Rebecca is amazing, and she will be able to answer those uh, uh, while she's doing her presentation, but there will be time um, uh, following her presentation, if there's any other questions that you may have, obviously you can raise your hand. I'm going to be operating um, uh, today's uh, webinar. Um, you can ask questions in the chat box or the Q&A, and we'll make sure to get those to you. This program is being recorded. Um, we'll send the recording uh, to this group after the program, so if you missed anything, you can have that. It'll also be located on the Chamber's website under the webinar on demand under our uh, media tab. Uh, so with that, I'm going to kick it over and introduce uh, and, and really thank our sponsor for making this happen, our business education series, but I'd like to, to have Eric uh, Dupis. Did I say that right? Yeah, yeah, Eric Snupis. Oh, all right, man. That's good. Uh, I was here on behalf of uh, um, Fraser Trebilcock, who is our sponsor of our business education series. So Eric, uh, good morning. Good morning. Thanks, Steve. Uh, we're so glad you could join us today. It looks to be a great and timely topic with Rebecca this morning. Fraser Trebilcock is proud to sponsor the series because we recognize how valuable it is for the Chamber to provide members like all of us with resources such as the series. Fraser Trebilcock is one of Michigan's longest established full service law firms that has offices in Detroit, Grand Rapids, and headquartered right here in Lansing in the Boju Tower. Some of our practice areas include business and tax, cottage law, intellectual property, little, <clears throat> excuse me, litigation, and trust in estates, just to name a few, but our attorneys are skilled in more than 70 niche areas, especially focusing on serving small to medium-sized business needs. When it matters in Michigan, we are the trusted legal advisors for businesses and individuals. You can learn more at Frazier, F-R-A-S-E-R, lawfirm.com. Thank you, and we hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you so much, Eric. And then with, um... Without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speaker, 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 Rebecca Bayard Cook, who's the CEO of Capital Fundraising Associates. Uh, CFA is a multi client fundraising firm providing board development and training, uh, strategic planning, capital campaign consulting, as well as overall oversight and program management. She is also my neighbor. We live down the street, although we're on Zoom together right now. Um, but just really excited to have Rebecca on here to talk to um, our, uh, our members and those attending uh, about fundraising in 2021. With, with that, Rebecca, uh, the screen is yours. I'm going to hide Eric's and I's uh, video and it uh, should be a great program. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Eric. I am very excited to um, be a part of this series and share with you some uh, 2020 fundraising trends. And I have to say, um, before we even start, right, that it's changing every minute. So, you know, uh, with more and more folks being vaccinated and different types of variants and the rules changing every five minutes, you know, this presentation that was originally written in February has had to be tweaked a couple of times. And so let me just say that, you know, everything you're gonna hear about um, that I've been talking about today um, are trends, I think, not only for 2021, but they are trends sort of moving forward, uh, what we're going to be seeing in the world as far as fundraising uh, in the next couple of months. And then also, I think some of these things are here to stay and aren't going anywhere. Um, again, as Steve mentioned, um, I love group participation. And so a webinar makes that um, a little bit harder. But if you do have a question, you know, raise your hand or type it in the chat. And I'm hoping Steve will um, recognize that and, and kind of interrupt me as things are going on. So please, if you have questions, go ahead and ask them. Um, I just have to minimize my screen. Okay, so the first trend I think 
that no one is going to be surprised about is that these, you know, everyone's moving into blended hybrid and virtual events. So they're here to stay. Um, for, um, for most of us, we have done a lot of fundraising in the last 12 months virtually. So all of the auctions and cocktail parties and socializing events, all of that has gone virtual. And that has, you know, benefits in that, uh, meaning that you can get more people from all over the state to participate. However, you miss a lot of the, you know, networking opportunities or conversations that would happen around a, a table or guests that, you know, Frazier might bring in uh, to hear a particular speaker talking about a particular event. So I think even with most um, adults expected to be vaccinated by May, um, there are still going to be donors who are hesitant to meet in person. Um, we don't know when the state is going to allow for more than 25 people to be indoors at a time. Um, so I am advising clients that they really need to explore options for events that allow both an in-person and a virtual experience. So I've got a couple of things taking place in September and October. One of them is an event honoring um, Mayor Archer in Detroit. Um, when we first started planning that event in October of last year, because we planned things out 12 months in advance, it was absolutely only going to be virtual. And um, the more and more we've talked with the mayor and our board, uh, there's a feeling that um, there is going to be about 100 people that really want to try to do this in person. So we are planning to have an event at one of the casinos in a banquet room big enough for 500 where we're going to be, you know, having our 100 guests with screens to monitor the event that's going to be online. So the um, and same thing with the Children's Trust Fund auction, many of you may be familiar with. Um, that auction is going to be in September of this year. The program is going to be online, but we are inviting our sponsors to come to a viewing party so they can still have that experience mingling with department heads and members of the legislature. So I think you're going to see a bunch of that. I have another event taking place in August where, um, again, it's going to be virtual, but we're encouraging folks who would normally sell a table to invite those people who they would invite to their table to their house and have a small viewing party of the event online. And so, you know, part of that is creating um, sort of a toolkit that even gives instructions for some of our older members on how you can turn whatever you're seeing on the screen on your computer or on your phone onto your television, if you have a USB port or if you have um, screen sharing so that they can have, you know, eight or 10 people uh, watching something um, while it's happening um, virtually. Um, in all of these cases, right, we know that at any moment, uh, state and local restrictions might change. And so all of our fundraising plans for virtual and in-person are also having, um, you know, with an asterisk, right, that if, if numbers spike or if there's a variant that um, the vaccines don't um, protect you from, you know, we're going to have to change that. And it might be that those sponsors who were hoping to be there in person to see the mayor or spend time with members of the legislature just aren't going to be able to do so. And we're just going to have to pivot if that's the case. Um, the, the, the issue for charities is going to be the added cost of production, right? So when everything went virtual last year, it was kind of nice because when you're getting 300 people in a room for dinner, you know, it can cost twenty, thirty thousand dollars by the time you get the A V and the, you know, drinks and the food and the desserts and the special VIP reception and all of that. Where putting on a virtual event costs about ten thousand dollars if you're using um, a, a video production company. So it was nice because even though charities might have taken a hit if they're not doing direct COVID related um, services, a lot of charities saw a hit in 2020. So saving the $20,000 on the cost of meals was good for them as they went all virtual. These hybrid events are going to cost a little bit more because you have that $10,000 cost and you're still going to have about $100 a person cost for doing um, something of, of screening of something. So just be aware of that. And when you're um, developing your sponsorship materials, you may want to create some new opportunities for people to underwrite either the cost of that reception or the cost of the video production, because it is going to be an added cost and it is going to sort of hit the amount of money that's available for the charity to use for programming. Um, any questions so far, Steve? 
None. All right. Right. All right. Um, so this is know your donor, right? This isn't really a trend for 2021. It just becomes increasingly important for 2021 um, because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. So first of all, I just want to make everybody aware there's a great transfer of wealth taking place in our country right now as um, money goes from the baby boomers to their children, the Gen X, you know, the, the, the uh, oh, um Gen X folks like me who have baby boomer parents and then the millennials who also have baby boomer parents. Um, in the US alone, it's estimated that between 15 and $68 trillion will be exchanging hands in the next few years. So knowing your donor and knowing how they like to give is important, right? So knowing that donors aged 50 and older statistically prefer to pay for make their charitable contributions with a check or by you know donating cash, that's good for you to know, right? Older donors tend to write larger one-time donations and younger donors tend to make smaller recurring donations, right? So that's good to know as you're thinking about fundraising with these groups. Gen Z is the newest uh, uh, group of donors. They are the most multicultural donors of any generation that we've seen and they want to see that reflected back. So the messaging that you're gonna to give to a, um, a boomer is different than that you would give to a, a Generation Z and just kind of tweak it to know that. Um, and younger donors are motivated, motivated by a sense of social responsibility and they wanna make be a part of that change making process. So um, what I have seen, right, is a lot of folks talking to older donors and we'll get into this a little bit more later about legacy. You know, the pandemic has made all of us think about our own mortality. And so some of those conversations are changing. For the younger donor, uh, it is all about you're stuck at home, you can't volunteer, but here are some things you can do. $10, $15, $20 can make a big difference. It's that kind of thought process. So again, it's always important that your messages are donor centric. It becomes increasingly important that you're having those donor centric messages during the pandemic when you can't have face-to-face -face interactions. Um, hand in hand with that is meeting your donors where they hang, right? So again, when, when you're able to have events and you're able to meet people and even you know socializing at a chamber after hours event, right, where a lot of sort of this networking and, and fundraising kind of takes place because you know what I do a lot of is try to match what does the donor care about? And then finding the charity to match to that donor so that it's an easy way to get them to say, yes, I wanna give because I'm asking the donor, do you wanna give something that I already know that you care about, right? So that's like the first part about fundraising. The other part is being able to get in front of the donor to make that ask. So that's what this is talking about, like meeting your donors where they hang out. So 50% of all web traffic is on this device right here. So if you're a fundraiser, for an organization and your website is not you know compatible to a mobile device you know the screen's cut off or you can't find the donate page or whatever you're at a disadvantage um, so you're going to want to take a look at making sure that that information is available on mobile devices um, social media impulse giving is on the rise so you know a lot of folks still are not on you know TikTok or Instagram, they tend to just be on Facebook because you know their board is older and their executive director is older and that's where those folks live. But if you're not on TikTok, if you're not on uh, Instagram, you're missing the younger folks. If you're not on LinkedIn, if you're not on Twitter and Facebook, you're missing the older folks. So there's you can't have one or the other. You've got to look at creating content for all the different platforms. Um, and that content is important, like what's on there. So, you know, gone are the days where you can just put a stagnant direct mail letter out. Now, all of these different platforms need video. They need pictures. And I'm going to tell you right now, stock photos are not good enough. It is way better if you can have pictures of, you know, volunteers doing things within the organization, even if it's just board members at a meeting. Um, you know, some charities don't have a, a lot of options for volunteers, but you still need to show faces and actual things that you're doing because that then tends to have the click-through rates go higher. Um, for older donors, right, we talked about it, they like to pay with a check. 
So if you're doing a mailing to those folks and you're not including an envelope for them to be able to send that check, check back to you, you're doing a disservice. Um, shockingly, there are still people who are not comfortable with credit card donations. So it's not enough to say, hey, you're reading this piece of paper, go on your computer or phone later to this link and you can give with your credit card. You really, really do need to spend the extra money for that reply device and you'll see those um, dollars, those donations go up because you're giving them a, a way to give that doesn't involve them having to find their own envelope later and putting it aside and then forgetting about it. Um, emails, right? We all still get, you know, I don't even know how many fundraising emails a day, at least 20. Um, but the click through rate on those are slowing down. And again, I'm going to point to your phone, text to give, those SMS messages are really, really, really um, on the rise um, during COVID. So 75% um, of consumers are okay with text from brands. So again, I ask you to think about the text that you're getting, you know, mate, for me, right? It's Macy's, it's JCPenney, and they're sending me at least one text a week, if not several texts a day. So if your charity is not also doing that kind of outreach, you are being out communicated by store brands. And so the money that I might have in my budget to go to um, the food bank or to the Humane Society might get sucked up by Macy's or JCPenney because they're talking to me on this device that I'm on five hours a day as opposed to you know sending me a flyer in the mail or shooting an email to me that goes directly into my junk box that I never see. I also want to point out that the click-through Rates are higher on the phone on SMS than they are um, on email. Um, and so, you know, it's a quick way to communicate to your donor. Um, and you may hear from folks, you're doing it too much, you're sending me, you know, you hear all the time, you're sending me too many emails, you're sending me too many texts. But I'm telling you, um, studies show that those numbers, those repeated messages, those emails sent over and over again actually are productive. And you may you know, lose a couple people who um, unsubscribe, but it's worth it in the long run. Uh, any questions now, Steve? Did you say um, one question that came in is what, um, how are you, is there a, um, an application to use for those SMS uh, type messages that you would recommend everybody? Um, so I, it all depends on what database you're using. Um, so I, I, my favorite is uh, Bloomerang. I think they're really easy to use and they are compatible both with GiveButter um, and um, DonorSource which is a, a database to let you do some research on your donors. So, um, you know, it's interesting um, to look at that. Hustle is another one that can be more expensive, but if you have a large database, it's pretty good to use. Um, for, for those of you who are um, using Little Green Light, you know, I think uh, Hustle is probably a good one to be taking a look at there. But you know, I think it all depends on the size of your organization how often you're gonna use it. Um, I think those are things for you to consider before making those decisions. Some of them can be quite pricey. Some of them will allow you to give a text but not tie a link for donations to it. So it's sort of do your homework and learn before you make that decision because there's a lot of different ways you can go. So I kind of hinted at this, but you know, legacy gifts are absolutely on the rise. Um, I uh, let me start by saying the advice on um, looking for those planned giving gifts, and it would be interesting to see what Fraser uh, uh, comments on this as well. It, it, this is really for your donor who's over 50, um, the, or 50 or over. And the reason for that is, um, is that uh, you have to maintain a relationship with a donor over time. So when you're talking about leaving a, 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 a charitable bequest in your will, which is what a legacy gift tends to be, you know, at age 50, right, I'm a lot closer to death than I am at age 30. So the charity who's talking to me about a legacy gift has to sort of maintain that relationship so that I don't pull them out of my will, right? And so that's a, a shorter relationship to have to maintain 
from somebody who's 50 to 80 than it is for somebody who's 30 to 80, right? So that's kind of the way to think about it. The other way to think about it is, you know, those of us who are older probably have different um, expenses. So, you know, um, I don't have daycare to pay for anymore. Um, in a couple of years, I won't have college to pay for anymore. So I will have I will start accumulating income in a way that I haven't been able to do so before. And so I might start be thinking more about my will, about my legacy. I mean, back at, at when my kids were first born, all of my money was going to go to them if something should happen to me. Now I'm thinking, you know what, they're almost on their own. They're going to have their own jobs. They're going to have their own lives. They're not going to need me to support them the same way. So I am going to have money to be able to put. Um, and I'm going to want to put those in organizations that that share those same core beliefs that I've had over my whole life. So there are just some things to kind of know as you're as you're starting to ask for those legacy gifts um, and you see the bullet points there. So a um, qualified charitable distributions rule allow traditional IRA holders 70 and a half years old um, a tax benefit. Um, they have a required minimum distribution in some cases if that is donated to a charity there's a there's a tax benefit to that. Mm -hmm. So in many cases, I'm seeing, um, I'm advising some of my clients, you know, if you're doing a mailing for a fundraising event, um, instead of asking that donor to write a check out of their checkbook, they can ask for that contribution to be made right out of their IRA. And, um, and so the check will come to you, the charity from their IRA. They never see the money, they don't miss the money, and there's a, a positive um, tax consequence for them on that. Um, these um, required minimum distributions must be taken annually beginning the year the donor turns 72. So if you have an older donor base and you're thinking about putting together some of these ideas, you know, the first thing that you might want to do is a donor survey. Um, you might want to send out a really quick very short one page kind of letter to your donors that you think might be you know around that age frame and just saying you know um are, have you ever thought about a legacy gift are you giving any other legacy gifts you know it's a bunch of questions and then you can put in some demographical information right like you know uh year of birth uh you know income all of those kind of questions at the end that can help you identify if you don't already have that information who within your database might be appropriate to approach for a legacy gift. Um, many charities are creating these legacy campaigns with multi-year fundraising pledges for older donors that can easily lead into charitable requests. So um, let me clarify that because I don't think I said it very well. Um, I have worked very closely with the Citizens Research Council. Uh, they're one of my clients that has a much older donor base. They have created a living legacy campaign where if donors get to, you know, um, 5,000 in five years or 10,000 in five years or 20,000 in five years, right, they are recognized a certain way um, at the annual, um, fun annual signature event. They're listed in the um, end of year annual report. They're given priority for certain things throughout the year, right? So these are these donors who have already said, "I want to give to you annually." Those donor, or you know, those donors, then it becomes very easy to talk about. Well, what kind of legacy? You know, this is the legacy that you've been leaving us while you're still here. How do you want to continue that legacy after you're gone? So sometimes I think people get really fundraisers get really um, held up by not knowing how to have the conversation because you're talking about people dying. And I think the easy way to flip that conversation is not to talk about people dying. We all know we're gonna die, but it's talking about legacy and, and what do you wanna leave and what is it about this organization that has made you wanna give repeatedly while you were alive and do you wanna see that continued on after your death? So um, you'd be surprised how easy it is. Um, you don't have to be an expert on tax law, which is what this next bullet is. Charitable bequests of cash um, are easy to make. They're easy for the donor to understand, and they're easy to incorporate into your existing fundraising activities. So even you know if you're doing an annual appeal, or you're doing direct mail, or you're putting you know information out on on the um, internet, you know, P.S. Did you know that we accept bequests? 
Did you know that you can include us in your will? Have you thought about including us in your will? Even if the, you know, again, if you're the food bank and you're talking about the increase of need that we've seen um, it, during the pandemic for families needing food assistance, right? And your plea is all about, you know, it's about to be the summer and increasingly uh, that means that um, distribution of food for children who normally would get that food when they're in class three days a week is changing, right? Could be all about summer need, but that, you know, PS at the end, have you thought about putting this in your will? At least kind of gets people thinking about it and I would strongly encourage you to do that. Um, it is not the charity's role to give tax advice or financial advice. It is our role to let you know that you should talk to your tax advisor or your attorney about how to make that gift. And there are, you know, you can give property, you can give art, you can give money, you can give a percent of your estate. Like all of that is up to you to, to, to up to you as the donor to decide what to do. What the charity should be doing is just putting the thought into your head, into your donor's head about, think about us, right? Donor advised funds are another growing source of um, funding for living legacy and plan giving donations. And I know um, our community foundation has done a great um, job with donor advised funds. And these are, um, these are funds that families um, set up as a conduit for their giving. So if you don't know that they exist, you can't sort of talk to donors about making gifts from those accounts. So just sort of, again, do your homework, learn a little bit more, you know, go on the Community Foundation's website, learn a little bit more about how donor advised funds work. You do have to be careful with donor advised funds because that really, um, you can't push too hard on that. The, the donor themselves, you know, have a responsibility to let the holder of those advised funds know where the gift wants to be made. But again, if you don't let your donor know that you accept those kind of gifts, it might be harder for them to give them to you. Um, and then um, it's just it's just putting it out there, right? Um, it's like any fundraising. Uh, you don't get unless you ask. So ask, ask, ask. Um, these are not dollars that you're gonna see today. These are dollars that you might see in 10 or 15 or 20 years, but unless you're asking for them today, you're never going to get there. Uh, any questions on that stuff? I don't see any right now. All right, great. Um, the other thing that we're learning more and more um, is uh, about the importance of personalization so to the donor. So segmenting out your database taking a look at what are people's interests? What are people's ages? What do they care about? How do I find out what they care about? Um, and, you know, and really sort of targeting your ask. So if you have the text to give program and you are, let's say an environmental charity and there is discussion about um, whether or not Nestle can take more water out of, you know, Michigan's, um, freshwater sources, right? You might, you know, if you know people who are very specifically in your donor base who care more about water pollution than they care about air pollution, you would then be able to send out a really quick text. Hey, reach out to the member of your legislature, remind them that, you know, that water should be whatever the charity's stance is on how that water should be used. You know, help us advocate for this. Call your state representative and make a donation so we can continue to advocate, right? So I'm segmenting, I'm making an ask to my donor based on what I know they care about, right? Or if you are, um, let's say, uh, on either side of the gun issue, right? Either pro-gun or you wanna see gun restrictions and there is you know, another um, issue that makes gun violence top of the, news chain, you know, as opposed to trying to get out a direct mail or get out an email that, you know, needs to be sort of approved by a whole bunch of people, 160 characters on a phone saying this is happening right now and we immediately need you to react. It's a pretty good way to sort of get the message to the donor you want to talk to. Um, I would say, you know, 
looking at your uh, database too, you know, is there a separate appeal that you want to do to lapsed owners? So, you know, the thank you for your contribution. We really appreciate your support. Will you give again is great for some donors, but if somebody hasn't been with you for two or three years, maybe you need to send out a, a, an appeal that's questioning, right? What, you know, how can we get you back? What do you need to hear from us? Why are you not, you know, why is this not important to you anymore? Those are some of the things you might want to think about asking your lapsed donors to bring them back into the fold. And then the more that you can create experiences, the more that you can focus directly to that donor, um, the better sort of fundraising you're going to have now and in the future. So um, I worked with Cistern. I don't know if any of you know Cistern, but they are a female choral group here in the Lansing area. Not a very big organization, um, but they are becoming increasingly more sophisticated on how they thank their donors. So right before the end of the year, you know, I got a text message saying, you know, we're doing our choral concert that we would normally do in person and we're doing it online and, you know, we, there's still a need to raise money, you know, will you give? And I did, I gave them a hundred dollars, you know, no, no big deal. Two weeks later, there was a message in my inbox saying, you know, sis, the sister and volunteer has sent you a video, right? And I clicked on it and it very, it was a woman who I've never met before, member of their board, who had a two minute video saying, Rebecca, as a fundraiser, you know how important it is to get folks to give. And I can't thank you enough for, I mean, it was about me, right? That two minute, somebody gave them five talking points about who Rebecca Bahar Cook is. And that two minute video was sent to me about me for me. I'll give again because I've never gotten a thank you like that before for a hundred dollars. I've seen, you know, for, and so I think that's probably because for them, $100 is a big gift, but think about that, right? Like we're dying to find ways for volunteers to do things during a pandemic, um, especially, you know, at first it was older um, citizens who weren't comfortable going out. Now those, their they have the vaccine and are more willing, but you know, there are still people who are me, for example, who are not comfortable in big crowds just yet. So as a volunteer, maybe you're asking me to make five videos, right? So now I'm, I have a, we talked about the millennials and they want to get more involved and they want to volunteer. So maybe what you do is you ask some of your millennials or Gen Xers or Gen Zs to do some of these recorded on their phone, you know, here are the list, here's five people, here's some information about them, record five videos. And then it's a great, great way to sort of have a face, face to face interaction with a donor that makes them feel special. Handwritten notes are another uh, very special thing that you can do to a donor that isn't very difficult. And again, this is a great thing for board members who have problems, not problems. Some, vote, some board members are restricted from fundraising, right? They just can't do it because their day job doesn't let them to. Okay, so they can't ask for money, but they definitely can get involved in the thank you process. So, you know, sending your board members 10 note cards with the name and addresses and dollar amounts of 10 people you want them to send a little thank you card to goes a lot, goes a long way in terms of keeping those donors engaged when they can't be with you in any other way. I have one a client who, when a donor gets to a, a certain amount, um, the, the executive director delivers a pie. Um, and so the reason why it's a, it's a pie delivery is because that comes with a glass pie tin. And in fact, I, he did it for me the other day. So I have to give this back to him, right? So now not only did I receive a thank you gift from the executive director coming to my door and dropping it off, now I have to go out of my way to get it back to him. So it's another interaction with the donor that brings me to his location to have some more interaction for me to see some of the services and programmings to get me more involved. Um, you know, not everybody is local. So if you're a statewide organization, maybe you ship cookies or maybe you send something from a local, um, you know, Michigan, uh, you know, Zingerman's or Cherry Republic or something like that that speaks, you know, maybe something Local. If we're Lansing, we can think of lots of folks that are close to home who do that type of stuff too. But you know, reaching out and giving them a gift that another charity isn't giving. Um, this 
I think is really, really important, especially as people are still feeling isolated. Um, these special thank you gifts sort of allow you to touch your donor and then give that donor one more reason to be involved and, and to give because you've gone above and aboard where others have gone. So those are sort of my five kind of thoughts for 2021 that I think are going to carry into 2022 and beyond. Um, and I kind of open it up for more Q&A if there is some. Well, thank you so much, Rebecca, for going through that. Um, I love that pie idea. That's pretty creative. Um, but yeah, we'll open it up for questions. I know if, uh, if, if folks have uh, any questions, you can ask those now in the chat box, raise your hand, Q&A. Again, this will be on our, um, our recording this, so this will be up on our website. We'll be sending it out. Um, be happy Doesn't to have to be up. about the presentation either, right? I bill myself as a fundraising guru, so if it's about anything, <laughs> you can try and trip me up too with a question if you've been dying to know something about fundraising and been afraid to ask. I guess I'll, I'll kick it off. What's your hardest? I mean, I have to do some fundraising too uh, on the chamber side of things and, and some volunteer uh, uh, work that I that I just volunteer on some boards. But what's the hardest? Uh, it's been what's hard for you or uh, I guess your clients too on is it is it the political? I guess I should say what type of front? I mean, fundraising is difficult, but what is probably the toughest that you have personally um, that you think? is the hard, uh, hardest one. During the pandemic or in general? You know what, so that's good. Maybe general and pandemic. That's a great, great point. So during the pandemic, it's been really hard for charities that are not doing direct service to, to validate their relevance, right? So again, if you're, you know, getting masks out to people or feeding, you know, feeding the hungry who've lost their jobs because of the pandemic, or you know, helping uh, children who are suffering uh, because they're not in the classroom. You know, those are some um, charities that I think uh, can directly tie the need to the pandemic and what's going on. And that has hurt those charities that tend, like the Citizens Research Council that I talked about earlier. Great organization, been around for 105 years. They need to be here, but they saw their fundraising drop because people were giving more money to other places. And that completely makes sense. So um, the challenge has been for those charities to still fight for their own dollars. It's hard sometimes, because even the charities themselves don't want to compete for those dollars if they see what they think is a greater need. Um, so you know, my answer to that is, yeah, you're going to take a hit. Uh, you're going to take a hit even if you do ask. So by not asking, it's going to be a greater hit. So I think that's one of the things that I've really been coaching people over the last 12 months is you have to ask. I mean, even if you think you're going to get a no back as an answer, it you have to ask and it makes the ask next year easier because they know they owe you one, right? So that would be um, pandemic um, specific. In general, I think the hardest piece for fundraising is starting. And what I mean by that, Steve, is you probably have a list of 10 people that you're assigned to call because, you know, you have a relationship with them and you've agreed to do it. And I would say even me, who's a professional fundraiser, the hardest thing is making that first call because you just don't know how it's going to go. And there's a very good chance, you know, you might hear no and nobody wants to hear no. But I, I guarantee um, once you make that first call, the second call gets easier, the third call gets easier, and that fourth call, and, I, and let me just preface this by saying, you're, you know, one out of every four people are gonna say yes. So you are going to hear no a lot, but that yes feels so good, especially if it's the fourth one, that then it like motivates you to do the rest of them. So I think, you know, making sure if you're the development director, that people like Steve have talking points they have information, they know where to send donors, they know all of the different avenues to give, whether it's, you know, a text or an email or going online, you know, having the credit card, debit stuff, um, making it as easy as possible so that Steve does feel comfortable 
And I think some of the best organizations that do it do role playing with their fundraising volunteers and board members. So, you know, if you have a board who is really, really uncomfortable fundraising and just doesn't do it, you know, maybe you pull aside 30 minutes in a board meeting or maybe you have a special board meeting training where you work with your board members on developing that message. So I would say, Steve, um, talk to me as a development director, and St I'm assuming Steve is raising money for the Lansing Chamber PAC right now. I would say, Steve, talk to me about why the PAC's important and why you give to the PAC. Because that's how everybody should start the conversations they're having, every volunteer should start the conversation they're having with um, potential donors to a, a charity or a PAC in this case. So Steve, you're talking about what the PAC does and why you give is, you know, is probably what's gonna motivate me to give. So spending time to help you construct how that conversation is gonna go and then giving you an opportunity to actually speak those words out in a friendly atmosphere in front of others so that you can fine tune that message so that you're not struggling and it's just flowing freely so that the very first real fundraising call you make goes smoother and you have a plan for how you see the call playing out because you've rehearsed it a couple times really makes a huge difference both in the volunteers um, willingness and preparedness to be able to make those calls and then two in the success rate they have once those calls are placed so steve after this call is over if you want to spend a couple minutes rehearsing your pitch for whoever you're doing your fundraising for call me up we'll rehearse it and i will be hard on you and i guarantee the first person you call will be way easier than i was and you'll get those success rates and it's 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 the yeses that motivate your volunteers to move forward. So I would also share that. So if you're having a board um, fundraising drive, and so I'm working with an organization right now that has a very, very small board, a board of 10 people, and our goal is between now and April of next year to find 100 donors to do $10,000 each, right? So we are pulling out those lists and we're sharing them with the board and every board meeting, each board member is given 10 new names. And then at the next board meeting, they're reporting back on how successful or unsuccessful they were reaching out to those 10 people. But in the meantime, if I have a board member who has successfully gotten a pledge, I am quickly texting you know, my group chat of all the board members saying, Hey, if, you, if you're on a meeting with Steve in the next week, chat them in the chat box, way to go for getting that $10,000 from Consumers Energy or whatever, you know, whatever, $1,000 from their neighbor, $100 from their wife, whatever it is, right? Making sure that volunteers are hearing, that other volunteers are doing it, that there's some peer accountability and it's being successful, that can also help. So Steve, again, not knowing what you're fundraising for, if you've got a text message for me that said, hey, Nicole Noel Williams, who's CEO of the airport now, just did her part and raised the money, where you at, that might also help motivate you to pick up the, the phone call and do that because you don't want at the next board meeting to hear how great Michelle did and you have to say, well, I didn't even make a call yet. You know, it doesn't, it just, it helps if, if you have that and uh, background, preparedness and then you know excitement to make the call and so that's what we really try to do is it's never easy it's never fun but once you do it once you start once you crack that egg you know that omelet's delicious so that's kind of what <laughs> oh, I heard. that's pretty good I like that um got a couple questions coming in now so um uh, first one uh, or second I guess but uh do you have any uh um, any suggestions on how to ask for funds at a time when many are financially struggling? Yep. Um, so uh, again, it's okay for your donor to say no, right? Like you don't always know where people at. Um, so, so part of it is setting up the expectation with the donor. So if, the, if they can't give money, can they give time, right? So Steve, are you willing to give X amount for, you know, $500 for the food bank. Oh, you can't right now? Totally understand. Could I ask you to write five thank you notes for other donors who have given, right? Trying to find a way to keep 
that donor who may not have funds now engaged and involved in the charity will help for you know the future um, when they do have resources. The other thing that you might be able to do is, depending on the situation, ask if that one-time gift can be segmented out recurringly. So Steve, you might not be able to give me $500 this month because your finances have changed and you have a spouse not working, but could you do $50 a month for 10 months to get you to that same, you know, that might be something that's a little bit more palatable. Um, and then the other thing is just acknowledging to that donor, I understand, um, you know, please you take care of what you need to take care of. I'm gonna reach back out to you in six months and we can have a conversation then, right? Also setting up the anticipation that there's gonna be an ask in the future when times are better. That Those are, you know, a couple of things that you can do um, to try and na navigate that. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up too. And I know you talked about it during your presentation and kind of the generational things, because that's what I've, you know, being 36, it's been, uh, you know, how do I get to a thousand dollars for whatever charity it is for that, for the year. And it's really just uh, working with that charity. And it's been like, you know, $83, 33 cents a month that they're, you know, they're pulling from me or I'm contributing. So they, yeah, it's, it's just a great point that you bring up. Um, yeah. And that really does sort of that's that that you know and again right for all don't all different income levels that works right so mm -hmm. for us it's eighty three dollars a month you know for somebody who's got a couple more zeros at the end of their paycheck you know they might do a thousand dollars a month to get yeah. to that ten you know but it's it's again just having that finding that communication tool so that you are either sharing with the donor the options or you know making sure that that they know. It's sharing those options with the donor. There's no other way to say it. Yeah, no, it's, it's good. Um, next question is, um, this person is planning to research businesses uh, who have flourished during the pandemic as a target market to call. Do you yeah. have any markets you would think would fit that bill? Oh, I've been playing this game all, all year. So uh, yes, um, IT firms are doing very well. Um, construction, home construction, uh, you know, everyone's, uh, upgrading, so looking at industries that are dealing with, you know, new carpeting, new siding, painters, and you know, all of that stuff, local, smaller businesses, um, uh, you know, uh, I am a huge proponent and would encourage all folks to try to get their hands on the Cranes book a list of lists, right, because they sort of indicate uh, industries by sector and who's doing well. So that's always a really valuable um, piece. Um, I would, I always crack open sort of the chamber stuff that's seeing, and I'm seeing who's sponsoring that because I figure if they're sponsoring chamber events, then they have some, um, you know, they're not in the middle of bankruptcy, right? That always helps. And taking a look at, you know, who's advertising not only with the chamber, but, but elsewhere. Um, I look at that kind of stuff. Um, but I, so those are great prospecting tools. Um, the key though, and I think this will always be that key, just because a company is doing well, doesn't mean they're gonna donate to you. So doing some research to determine why they might wanna give to you, like what is the connection? Is it that their mission ties with yours? Is it that there's a board member who, who cares about your organization? Is there somebody in the C-suite who might be able to get their request put in front of the right place, who is passionate, right? Because it's not just about they have money and you need money. It's about developing a relationship so that the ask is donor centric. And so that's, I would say, even more important than who's doing well and who's not doing well, is is there a tie that makes sense for that company or that organization or that person, quite frankly, to give beyond just that they have cash. That's good. And then we just have a, another one here. Um, could you talk a bit about your perspective regarding the importance and role of a development um, committee? I'd probably direct or two, but yeah, development committee during the pandemic. Uh, yeah, so I am a, I am a big proponent. <laughs> of uh, developing volunteer committees to help with fundraising. Um, it's, it's really the, the, the um, 
crux of what we do at Capital Fundraising Associates. And so, you know, the, the board, the development director, and the executive director are a very small universe of people who um, are supposedly responsible for fundraising. And many of us know that um, not all board members and not all executive directors are good at it or put the time in it um, or give it the attention that it needs, right? So I am a huge believer in finding volunteers within the community who care about your issue, who are willing to reach out to, to people in their professional and personal networks to raise money. And so I have to actually give Steve some uh, credit here because uh, I have recruited him and he has agreed to serve on some of these committees that I build throughout um, um, our local area. But they can be huge, huge, huge um, advocates for you and raise quite a bit of money. So, I mean, just think about it this way, right? So if you're an organization and you are planning um, to have an event, it, you know, uh, um, a big fundraising event where you're trying to get sponsorship from a whole bunch of local corporations, but you've never done it before, all right? So crack open your existing donor list and take a look at, you know, who are the people who give, who've been giving three out of the last five years, or who are the people who give you monthly donations, and where where do they work? Do they have inroads in to where, you know, some of the companies that you're trying to reach out to, or um, what, connection do some of these people have with others? So um, trying to think of a, a good example that I can give. So when we were, um, um, so right now I'm in the middle of doing, I'm building a committee for the Children's Trust Fund. They are the statewide organization that is like the umbrella organization for all the child abuse neglect councils in the state, right? Wear blue, April, Child Abuse Prevention Month. Um, because they are the statewide organization in charge of monitoring and um, helping to fund all of these 83 county programs, um, we have recruited members of the legislature, the quadrant, um, so it's Shirky, Wentworth, Ananik, and Lazinski to be on the advisory board, right? Well, you and I and everybody on this call knows, you know, they're not gonna do a ton of fundraising for us, they fundraise for their own things and they're very busy running state government. But I can then use those four as a reason to reach out to the lobbying community and people who are in associations because they want to have a relationship with those four. So I'm raising money for child abuse. And so I'm reaching out to all of the multi-clients and I'm saying there's somebody in your office who cares about the well-being of children and wants to have regular exposure to these members of the legislature who are going to be at you know, my five committee meetings, let me know. Do they want to be on the auction committee you know, that solicits gifts? Do they want to be on the sponsorship committee that's you know, soliciting dollars? Or do they want to be on the marketing committee that's going to be a publicizing this event that's going to be taking place in September all over the state, right? And so by finding out who are the people in those organizations that care about child abuse or care about child abuse prevention, I should say, or you know, have children themselves or whatever, I am growing the universe of people who will eventually be helping me raise money for this event in September. So as opposed to the you know, 10 board members, the executive director and myself, I'm now building 20, 30, 40 volunteers asking each of those volunteers to make three to five phone calls each. That's all I ask them to do, bite-sized pieces so that it actually can do it. And now I've exponentially increased the amount of outreach being done for this event. You know, as opposed to 10 people doing it, I now have 40 people doing it. So as opposed to 30 calls being made, right, whatever the four times, th 40 times three is, 120 calls are being made. So, you know, it, it, it can, really, really make a difference. Now, there's a ton of work involved with that, right? So I just talked to Steve about how important it is that he feel comfortable with the asks, that he rehearses it um, a bunch of times, that, that he has everything he needs to do that. So now my role is no longer 
making 120 calls, right? Now what I'm doing is coaching those 40 people so that they can make their calls. So, so if you're gonna build a committee like that, just be cognizant of the, the um, amount of work it takes to cultivate those folks to be able to do the asks and do them well. That was a very long answer to say, yes, go ahead and do it. Do your best to match the charity's interest with the volunteer's interest because you know that's what makes a, a volunteer want to do it because they have a passion in the first place. So if none of those organizations that I'm reaching out to have somebody who cares about children because they either never have children, never want to have children, or don't like children, they're not going to be the best advocate advocate for me, and I'm just going to move on to the next. Yeah, no, that's um, no, and Rebecca has brought me on uh, to uh, some of these charities and been on those committees, and you know, just speaking from my experience of being one of those committees, it is uh, when you do have a, a team like Rebecca, and, and they are so good at making it very easy as well. Um, for those committee members, because we're all busy. A lot of, you know, we're volunteers on these boards or, or these development committees. And uh, to make it easy like that and, and uh, kind of run through just like what we've been doing for this hour, um, it is all helpful on um, when you do build those committees, as well as the volunteer, like myself or anybody else that would be on there uh, to feel comfortable to, to be able to do it and, and at least carve out the time to do it. and. Uh, so no, it's been it's been great, obviously with um, with Rebecca and her team putting that together. But um, but no, thank you, Rebecca, on, on that uh, on that response to that too. And thanks for throwing me out there. Um, <laughs> I know we got a couple. I guess we got a couple more minutes, but um, I don't see any other questions. Um, but I just want to thank you, Rebecca. I know we can get your information out to everybody. Um, just again with everybody attending, thank you, thank you, Rebecca, thank you, Eric, uh, uh, for uh, participating in uh, today's webinar. Again, happy birthday, Rebecca. Thank you. Hope you have a, a, a nice day. Hopefully, it warms up. But um, thank you very much. We'll see everybody soon. Thank you. Anybody need me, you can find me.